Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm very happy to announce that this is our very first in-person Y Exchange after the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, it's so exciting. It's actually in a hybrid. There's some people joining us through Zoom, which is awesome. Um, da, 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 what I wanted to say, this light is very bright, but I'm here. You can see me. Uh, <laughs> Has been to Y Exchange before. Oh, some new people here then. Awesome, beautiful. Uh, this is, uh, we started Y Exchange in 2014. Uh, we are doing this event together with three other organizations, which are Jurassic Resident Artists, Pro, PC Theater, and 836M Gallery. Kinetech Arts is here in residency for three months. We have some shows coming up, which is gonna be in April. I'll talk about that later, but now I would like to focus on uh, Terry and Jonathan. Thank you so much for being here tonight. We're very excited to learn more about your work. Um, this is how it's gonna go tonight. We have a 25 minute talk with Terry. We're gonna start with Terry. And then we have a 25 minute talk with Jim, Jonathan and then a half hour Q&A for you guys to ask questions. Um, am I forgetting anything? Wait on. Oh yeah, so this is H36M. That's an incredible gallery. Uh, there are two spaces here. This is H36M gallery. They have lots of exhibitions here, lots of visual art. A dance residency is actually a, a brand new thing. I think we are probably the third company here as like a dance company residency. And then there is also Next World, which is on the other side. By the way, if you need to use the restroom, just let us know. We're gonna let you in through that door. The bathrooms are inside. That's Next World. It's an investment company. And they support 836M Gallery with all the artistic, um, everything that's happening here. Already said, I guess we're done. I am gonna pass on the ball to Patricia Lissandrini. She's one of our collaborators who's doing this incredible, beautiful uh, installation and I will let her carry. So hear and see that, feel it, because you probably feel a little bit of vibrating. So I have the honor and pleasure of introducing Terry Bellier. So um, Terry is actually uh, one of my colleagues at Stanford University. She is an associate professor in the Department of Art and Art History. Uh, Terry has, uh, is also the head director of the Sculpture Lab. So Terry's work inherently interdisciplinary. So even though I'm in the Department of Music, we have the pleasure of getting to know Terry sometimes because Terry's work deals so specifically with movement and sound. Uh, so it's often uh, collaborating as you'll see um, with, with people in music and sound as well. Uh, Terry has, has had a, a career of showing her work in, in many places around the world. Um, but I just want to focus on the work itself, how exciting it is. Um, it brings in many different theory, uh, kind of area, this interaction of sound and movement itself. Um, also uh, LGBTQ plus uh, themes and, uh, and themes from her own life, life history. Um, and working in a range of different mediums, whether it's uh, intimate sculptures or these gigantic uh, uh, kind of mechanisms that we're going to see. So we're really honored to have Terry joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Patricia. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Um, I'm excited to be here. Um, my first Y exchange too, as a even presenter or audience. Um, so I'm going to just jump right in because I 
brought a lot of uh, I brought a lot of work to talk about. Um, and we'll see how far we can get through it. Um, so yeah, I work a lot with um, uh, um, I, I feel like my work comes from a, a sculpture base. Um, and but there's always something about it that I want it to do something. So whether that's sound or movement, but it's always tied conceptually to um, the environment and climate change um, and queerness. And so queerness and ecologies are sort of like sort of my steadfast friends. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm gonna just jump right in. So this is like a really early piece called Self Leveler. Um, and it has like a um, early, uh, I was thinking about how do you manifest the idea of the tipping point? And so this sculpture rocks back and forth and it actually does fall over, um, or it did fall over a couple of times, but it's controlled by this, uh, this ax that I cast in the middle there that, um, and I was thinking about like an early man-made um, device that had altered the land and that was sort of the beginning of us, um, uh, beginning of our collapse, I guess. And then in the, in the top, in the sort of um, the view into the ocean there is a video of ocean and I'm using a early um, Wii remote to level the water as the, um, sculpture rocks back and forth. Um, and then this is a piece by one of my favorite artists, Felix Gonzalez Torres called Untitled Perfect Lovers, which he made when his, um, his partner was diagnosed with AIDS and he knew he was gonna pass away and that they would eventually go out of sync. Um, and this was sort of a homage to, to him. Um, my piece called Perfect Lovers and it's, um, um, a lot of my works were dealing with these natural timekeepers. So I was looking at a lot of like tree ring, um, um, dendrochronologist and tree ring um, data and also like course sampling and how seeing sort of how the nature is being recorded. Um, and so this was the idea of like of two couples sort of um, mirroring each other in the same way that the Felix Gonzalez clock piece does. Um, and then this was um, another piece I did at the beginning of, of a residency at the San Francisco dump. Um, Recology has an artist in residency program and I'm still on the board there, which is it's an amazing, um, amazing what comes out of there when artists <laughs> end up at the dump and you make, you do, you have a four month residency and, and all your work has to come from the, the um, the transfer station, which is here. Um, and so you pull out all your materials from this space and um, come up with work. Um, and the first piece um, was this um, shopping cart called Smart and Final. And I was thinking about the weight that um, consumerism has on and um, the individual as well as as a larger body. <clears throat> um, and so the shopping cart was a fun thing to work with because um, it's about a block or two from the transfer station to where your studio is at Recology. And so the shopping cart is your tool to collect what you need. Um, and so you're constantly, you know, you have your cart, and you're just pushing it back and forth. Um, and so for me, it also became, um, seeing it as a tool, I thought oh, it was the perfect place to start with um, for having, uh, and, and also Recology is, um, so as I was saying, you have to use everything that comes from the dump. So the cement trucks um, um, would, Recology has these huge molds for like high, for highway barriers. And so when there's, um, you, you, you probably know this, but um, no one ever wants to order under order their cement or concrete, right? So you always over order. So there's always leftover and there's waste. And um, the research I was doing at the time was, um, this was for the, the Palo Alto dump, but is like 40% of the waste is concrete and cement. 
and it's all from like um, demolitions and construction. Anyway, so they they have the, the cement trucks come there and you were able to like, you know, whenever I just, so I basically I built this mold and then as soon as they um, got some cement, a truck coming in, I ran out so we could, so we could pour it. Um, and I, anyways, I won't go into that. <clears throat> Um, and then the other project, another, I did, I did 17 projects there, but this was um, a piano that I took apart and um, thinking of it as a primarily a solo or a, a duet instrument and turned it into this um, circular instrument that um, more than um, one person could play and, and took apart um, um, computer keyboard and reprogrammed that to each of the keys and found a laptop in the dump. Anyway, so and then just ran a MIDI program so that um, the uh, so then basically each key would play its original key. Um, there it goes. So this was fun because I liked seeing like these people didn't know each other. They just started playing at the opening. Um, and then I also like watching um, uh, professional or people that know how to play the piano play it because it was really frustrating for them um, because the keys are just spread wide enough apart. You could see them trying to get, I don't know what you call it when you get a roll going, but they kept getting really frustrated. Um, and they had to relearn how to approach this instrument. Um, and then this is a sound sculpture I made um, called When Comes the Sun. And um, this was uh, a residency I had in Norway and it was the first time I experienced 24 hour sun or almost 24 hour sun. It would get dusk for about three hours. Um, and so I wanted to have all my um, projects made by the sun or powered by the sun. So I did a series of cyanotypes, but then also wanted to figure out how to bring in um, solar power to the sculpture. Um, and so you probably can assume from the title that what song it will play. So I don't know if you can hear it, but it plays Here Comes the Sun um, by the Beatles. And it'll go faster or slower depending on how much solar, um, how much sun is out that day. Norway was kind of fun because it's very uh, turbulent weather. So sometimes it would, wouldn't play at all. And sometimes um, uh, the times I showed it in California um, was the punk rock version because it would go really fast with the sun. Um, and then um, it also sort of sounds like a kind of a dying cassette tape or something. So I like how it kind of alludes to these other technologies. Um, this is a, um, a top um, and this was actually from my thesis show in grad school. Um, it came from the time where I was, uh, I worked in the, the, US, the Peace Corps and I was in Jamaica. And there's a extremely homophobic saying there that two pan lids can't meet, uh, which was translated as two vaginas can't come together, um, which at the time was like, I was uh, unable to respond to it in a way that would allow for my safety. Um, and so years later, I kept finding these pan lids um, abandoned in thrift stores um, and, was always scavenging for sculpture objects and um, just started collecting all these pan lids. <clears throat> um, and so I made that the larger pyramid um, here and there was speakers inside them and it played um, sort of a counter to the two pan tops 
camp meet um, saying um, with friends of mine in Jamaica that were reciting um, my new saying that they can meet. And, um, and then as I was doing that, I started setting aside all these, um, the, the panlids that kind of resonate and actually have a, a, a tone or a note to them. And that became the Panlid Gamelon series. <clears throat> um, and, and then they've, and then that, this, this piece, I guess, is sort of the piece that started inviting a lot of uh, musicians and composers that wanted to work with me over the years. Um, and this is uh, the Living Earth Show uh, performing on them. Um, just giving you a little bit of. <clears throat> Diane, if you hear me, can you make sure we hear audio from the videos that are being played? We're not hearing audio from the videos. Um, I'm just going to give you a little flavor of that. Um, this is. This piece is called Waiting for the Other Shoe to dot, dot, dot. Um, um, so it's a, it's a room full of shoes <clears throat> that um, rise and fall cases. Um, and this, this version was in 20. Um, and it actually, another shoe dropped, which is the pandemic, and the show was like shut down two weeks earlier, and um, I couldn't get to it for six or nine months. Um, but I was thinking a lot about the uh, political climate. Um, I was thinking a lot about um, queer, trans, BIPOC uh, rights being taken away and what it felt like. And it continues to feel like to live um, as there's a conservative um, rise in the U.S. and across the globe, um, and so I'm always kind of looking for like humorous ways, humorous ways to kind of address uh, more complex topics. <clears throat> um, and so this piece has a, about a 15-minute um, choreographed piece. Um, where the shoes rise and fall seemingly independent um, and then they kind of all meet at the top for this crescendo and um, and I'm working with um, Max programming and um, Arduino's up there in the in the rafters that are controlling all that um, and then this this project is called um, a kind of ache um, and it started right before the pandemic or the conversation for it did. And um, um, it was sort of brought on, um, the collaboration was sort of instigated by the Living Earth Show, um, which are um, musicians, um, Andy Meyerson and Travis Andrews, um, based here in San Francisco and in Portland. And um, they, really wanted to bring Sarah, the composer Sarah Hennes and I together. Um, the idea being that Sarah had worked with um, these uh, thrift, thrift store bells that she collects. I think she has like over 100 or 200 of these um, cheap little bells that she finds at the thrift store as well. Um, and there's a rule, I guess, that they have to be under dollars. Um, and and she's interested in them thinking of these like queer discarded lives that have been tossed aside. And, um, and Andy and Trap knew about my kids and they really were interested in what would happen if these queer objects came together or if just these two artists came together. <laughs> um, so we worked around that for, it ended up being a couple years of conversations. Um, um, over Zoom because of the pandemic, because Sarah's based in New York, um, and we're all out here on the West Coast. So we ended up having lots of conversations about, um, um, well, I guess the first, it started off with me seeing Sarah a box of pan lids, and Sarah sent me a box of bells. And I started playing around, um, with, we started kind of playing with each other's um, material, I guess you would say. 
Um, and for me, it started with the, the bells and I mounted them on this, um, this center um, uh, sculpture, this vertical wheel that spins. And I started seeing like the sheep dances and compositions with shaking the bells, throwing the bells and such. So I wanted to find a way to bring them into the, my kinetic sculptures more. Um, and so, so that's what, that's what happens with the bells. And then we were also trying to just think about like, what would it be like to create, um, um, I don't know, or this like queer impulse of imagining a new world, um, an alternative reality um, with its own sound, its own related language, its own relationship, its, its environment. Um, and I think an early question that sort of prompted us was like, what would it feel like to be the majority? Um, and so thinking about how, like sort of the impossibility of a, a completely queer trans space. Um, and so, um, and then I think uh, several of my sound and kinetic sculptures have this kind of interactivity to them. And when I work with performers, I do kind of like having this like, uh, like task to do. So like this overhead wheel acts as this kind of constant thing that the three performers are activating throughout the time. Um, and, um, and so there's that, and that, so that continuously kind of spins throughout it. And then um, maybe I'll just show you a couple of clips so I don't have to talk about it. Um, so this is sort of the, I'll show you three clips. This is sort of the beginning section uh, where it starts out a little darker and quieter. Mm -hmm. And then, And the, um, the, the chimes at the top on the, on the large overhead wheel um, is called a million queers plea, please, plea in parentheses, the SE in parentheses. Um, and I, I think during the pandemic, like I, I don't feel like I have a lot of color in my work. I just wanted something that was like extremely bright, something super like, and powerful and so um, I ended up just doing this really sick thing of like dizing aluminum tubes um, but was really happy with the effect because then when we got to the theaters like working with the lighting designers it ended up being like really fantastic um, like it kind of we could really bright we can make it blue we can make it purple we can make it red and it was like a really uh, part of the collaboration is then being the theater working with this whole other group. Um, this section is, um, uh, well, I'll just play it. It's, um, there's an, another smaller sculpture on the ground that, um, and, and I guess one of the ways we worked is we all met in the studio once um, before all, before the large sculpture was finished and just started playing with my um, prototypes and what we had in the studio. And from that, Sarah went back and kind of wrote the piece after a weekend. Um, so here's this middle section. <clears throat> and there's, this was, I call it a happy accident, but like we working with the lighty designer suddenly this like large sculpture became like this clock form when we were projecting down on it for this section. Um, and it's something I really um, 
one of my favorite parts of it. Um, and then this is sort of the closing. <clears throat> so along with the chimes um, hanging on the large overhead wheel, there's um, three of the pan lids that I have. And so there's sort of this um, final moment at the end where they each um, take down one of the pan lids and um, they're bowed for about five minutes until it goes into dark. <clears throat> I mean, one of the things I really enjoy about collaboration is um, uh, I mean, something that even even just sound sculptures that I have in the gallery, sometimes I feel like people approach them in a way completely different than how I intend them. Um, and I think there's, and, and most of the pieces have an openness to them that allows for that kind of um, diversity to occur. Um, and also working with composers and musicians um, over the years, it's sort of taken off the pressure. Uh, like I don't have to be an expert in every, everything, which I really like. Um, and also, it, it, and I think what, um, for those of you that collaborate, no, it's like, it's not like one plus two is three. It's like this new thing happens when um, the two of you or four of you get in the room together. <clears throat> um, and then I'm just gonna show some of the, uh, these other pieces that are um, kind of where my head has been at for the last several years, which is, um, I'm kind of obsessed with Sarah Ahmed's, um, who wrote Queer Phenomenology. And um, she's written a lot about desire lines and this idea of, um, you know, the desire lines is this landscape architect term um, for those paths where you walk off of the sidewalk or the main road and you form these, these paths that get worn in, in the road, but in the dirt. <clears throat> and she's thinking of these as, um, as queer paths or queer, 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 um, you know, these alternative lines um, and these unexpected ways because that there's not a path that's given for us. <clears throat> and so I really kind of love that idea. I mean, I think I like the physicality of it and, the, and I actually have always enjoyed looking at these desire lines. Um, and then I've also been thinking a lot about the Mobius strip um, and, it's a non-orientatable form. And so immediately to me, that just became a queer form. <clears throat> and so I've been really having a lot of fun in the studio. Um, I do a lot of woodworking. It's something that comes really fluid to me. Um, and uh, this project has just allowed me a lot of uh, time in the studio to have a lot of fun. Like all, my only goal is to make the Mobius flip at some point, but I'm not I'm not rendering these and um, uh, I'm not drawing these out ahead of time. I'm not, I'm not um, rendering these in CAD or anything. Um, and uh, and then I was also looking for like a place for these Mobius to live and to land on, and ended up um, thinking taking photos from just daily hikes as well as longer weekend hikes. <clears throat> And so I'm laminating this other line into the wood using two different woods. Um, and this one, I tried to not interrupt it. Um, and the other ones, I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm interrupting that line, but in embracing that sort of, um, instead of thinking of that interruption as a failure, thinking of it as um, um, those reroutings as actually just the, the the best thing, you know, like that it's actually the, the path that you have to take. Um, and so they all rest on these, um, I wanted these kind of soft pillows for them to land. Um, and um, yeah, so they kind of get these totally crazy forms like this one, like I thought I had flipped it and then I realized I hadn't. <laughs> and so then I just like, you can see like hundreds of little pieces that I keep cutting and just joining till I get it. Um, and I just got a few more here and then <clears throat> so <clears throat> I think I'm right about at 25 minutes so I'm gonna stop there <clears throat>
and hand it over to Jonathan. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Terry. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah. yeah. So we will wait for uh, um, the second speaker finish, then we have all the Q&A together. I'm just inspired. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, first, I have no idea how to do that. Those work. Do you need help on setting up? No, I just need a couple minutes. A couple minutes. So <laughs> maybe I can okay. while you set it up. Sure. Set up yeah. Back. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so I'm extremely happy. Let me realize that. Um, Really, it's like after three years of pandemic, um, where we had a lot of events online, but we really dying to have this in person, have this like intimate communication exchange. Uh, so finally, it's happening. And today we have two fabulous. Close my mouth. Yeah. Can can you can they hear me now? Okay. Yeah. It's really two amazing artist and uh, uh, tonight I'm extremely extremely uh, excited extremely happy uh, so Jonathan and um, we we found Jonathan and in, in the San Francisco um, dance film festival a few months ago and um, now um, so uh, there's a lot of dance film happens in, in the dance film because it's dance film festival and then we saw this like a uh, of uh, robot dancing uh, it was like, whoa, somebody made a robot dance and the robot dancing really fabulously and very convincingly. So, so, so I was waiting uh, after the film and grab him to ask him, who are you? Where, how do you do that? Uh, where, do you, where do you do it? And, uh, and learned, learned that we actually share a lot of uh, similar interest. So, so Jonathan uh, graduated from with a computer science degree, and uh, and he's he's he did a lot of uh, neural network. I mean, today, all those deep learning AI really just neural network, but with way more advanced. So, and he uh, he went on to become a, a researcher in MIT, and then a professor in uh, in Berkeley. And but what's interesting is he's is not only did a lot of work between art technology but he's himself is also entrepreneur he's um, um, doing a few startups just like uh, I think he will tell you more uh, in his talk uh, but it's really uh, one of the subject for me personally is interesting is yes I love to the art the science uh, but also this entrepreneurship angle is how do you turn something that of interest uh, idea something you know there's a value but into something that actually many people can use into something that's uh, self-sustainable. It's a huge challenge. Um, I'm struggling with that. And uh, so I, I'm extremely interested, curious to learn from Jonathan uh, uh, how he approached those things, how he did those things, did what he has done. So are you? I'm ready to go. You yeah. ready? Okay. Let's give it a shot. OK. All oh, right, uh, so I'm going to tell a story of a misfit, uh, my own struggle. Uh, of colliding uh, in my philosophy of colliding art and science. Um, it hasn't been easy. I feel like I, I now know who I am and, and what I need to do. Um, along that, I want to zoom in on my journey of, of making this new body of work around bespoke, choreographed, articulated mechanical structures. So let me get going. Um, so my artwork comprises an artistic and scientific examination of mind, body, and society. Specifically, it explores the intersection of sensory motor modalities and the challenges and mysteries 
of motor control, perception, representation, and emergent phenomenon. I'm driven, driven by a deep curiosity and utilize a wide range of techniques to get at the truth. I find that art and science are more similar than different um, and, and feel that a multidisciplinary approach is crucial. Making artwork is akin to a scientific inquiry. It starts with questions and results in some answers and always more questions. On the other hand, art allows for the introduction of scientifically inadmissible techniques and processes that bring about radical results. And thus, hand in hand, art and science can make vast discoveries. So I wanna start with presenting minimals. I haven't really shown it very much. I really was participating in a very experimental um, art group um, out in Boston, um, showed this piece. It's, it's, um, I was really uh, excited by the idea of what is abstraction. So this is uh, scientifically determined minimal art sculptures produced with digital materials with um, uh, collaborator Jonathan Ward. So I started with what is abstraction? It led to this notion of 50% recognizable as a measure of ideal abstraction, um, a place where it's on the edge of recognizable and unrecognizable. So I did this by crowdsourcing the answer, adjusting the resolution, and came to this idea of like um, what would be um, recognizable. I, played, I, I presented a bunch of animals at varying resolutions got the answer. So that's the first one. I'm particularly drawn to movement and the sculptural form. I find that space-time behaviors are exhilarating and most of my work involves choreographic aspects. I aspire to create a new kind of physics with its own laws playing out other worlds with parallel systems of equations and producing a strange grace chock full of revealing surprises. I'm interested in how bodies interact, how int intimacy is attained, how minds work and how societies function. And so this work here is um, a piece that I did. This is um, a robotic animation that I did um, with original score by Michael Gandolfi. It played live, uh, it toured uh, through the United States. It was played live with a music ensemble, it was projected on the screen. So it was like a, an interesting dance on film with a live uh, ensemble playing. Um, and uh, this was choreographed using a new high level programming language called Proto for space-time programming of amorphous substrates that I developed at MIT with uh, grad student Jake Beal. Jake and I wrote over a dozen papers about it and, and I personally made over a dozen artworks with it. So it really drove my research and my art. Um, I strongly, so I was saying, like, I strongly believe that developing entirely new art-making programming languages produces tremendous leverage towards understanding a phenomenon and creating great artworks. Quite simply, unless one can name something, um, one cannot represent it in any powerful way. Creating phrases and sentences brings additional traction and inventing syntax and semantics gives unprecedented power. Ultimately, the ability to communicate and to execute expressions written within an invented programming language allows for the testing of theories and the development of a set of reusable building blocks. The language defines and confines what is thinkable and expressible and therefore being able to create new programming languages allows me as an artist to break into uncharted artistic territory. So this, the picture here is a frame from what I would have loved to have shown you, the real uh, the thing running, but it was a stream processing programming language. It was the first programming language I actually did. It abstracts over time and space. Um, I made a couple dozen pieces with this, um, showed uh, in many galleries and, 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 uh, and venues. It was hugely influential in my scientific work for a couple decades and remains so. Um, um, it really just kind of informed me that this was possible and, and that it would drive a whole body of scientific re research as well as art. This piece is called Backup. It was presented at the 2004 Montreal International Festival on New Cinema and New Media. It's an interactive video and solution series that responds to people's movements by amplifying and replicating them. So, um, like Terry, I focus on installation and performances that create drama and powerful experiences, invite more participation. I'm excited about occupying space and integrating art into architecture and onto the stage. I'm constantly exploring ways to make new media more volumetric and visceral so as to be as engaging as human performance. I am also perpetually 
exploring intera interactive mechanisms that can invite, relate the audience and performers more fully into um, and to the piece and to ultimately involve them and set up a worthy dynamic. Finally, I'm drawn to the use of sculpture and public art towards creating ritual. So I'm excited to present here the Intimacy Machine from 2004. It's a reciprocal peep show routed through a computer tricking people into overcoming their normal social boundaries. <laughs> so people are tricked into like being very close and being able to look at each other's into each other's eyes through this kind of comp computationally mediated um, mechanism. Um, I am deeply influenced by the work of Harold Cohen and Miller Puckett. They were my mentors at UCSD and IRCOM respectively, and they taught me the skill of breaking down artistic ideas and computational steps to use representations to codify artistic processes and develop languages to enhance the creative process. Here's a picture of Harold Cohen. A lot of people don't know him. He's one of the pioneers of computational art. Some call him the first digital artist. I started working with him as a freshman in 1980 and continued my five, year undergrad, my five undergrad years at UCSD. I, on the right, I'm the blurry uh, kid there um, in his studio with all those drawing machines. I was his artistic assistant and worked many summers with him. It was an incredible experience. Um, and uh, also worked with Miller Puckett. Um, he was my boss and mentor at IRCOM in 1992 through 1994, where he wrote, um, before I came, he wrote Max M M FTS, and later at UCSD, where he wrote P PD as a professor at UCSD. His design apps are some of the most used tools for composing interactive electronic music. Um, I love this quote, electronic music would be very different without this pioneer. Um, it was incredible to have him uh, at my, as my boss. Um, here's a picture of where I spent 1990. I'm setting the stage because I'm going to get into it, how this all pulls together. But um, at IRCOM was this, um, you might not know, but uh, National Institute of Musical Research. Arts are really funded in France, and this is incredible. Um, after grad school, I was there as, a, as like a postdoc, um, the building right in the brick building on, the, on sort of in the center. Um, uh, after that, I spent years in academic research while simultaneously pursuing an unlikely art career and an often oppressed and <laughs> underground art career in, in the scientific world. Um, while I've been making art, I've continually had challenges designing and fabricating my artwork. I always wanted to do physical things um, and build things, and it was always so hard and super dangerous. Um, and this led me to think uh, deeply about design and its limits. In particular, I was consumed with mechanical design and how it is quickly overwhelmed with tedious details. In order to tame these details, there's a tradition of using constraints in design and even drawings. Instead of giving exact coordinates for everything, shapes are constrained by measurements, including angles and all, and often they're relative, and, and, and there's just a lot less detail to just do it in this high-level way. Um, there's a long history of constraints in mechanical design, including one of the earliest systems called Sketchpad, created back in 1963 by Ivan Sutherland in his PhD thesis at MIT. It was hugely influential. It was one of the earliest um, CAD CAM systems, and it had the notion of constraints built into it. Um, from there, I spent a bunch of time thinking about how to modernize these concepts. How could I express constraints mathematically and solve them best effort? Now, there are a lot of CAD packages for expressing them visually, but how do you create a programming language of the sort that I had been doing of constraints. And, and so like I went through all the exercises of doing what Sketchpad can do, but programmatically. And, um, and then I started thinking like, could I run these like, um, you know, over time and like all the time and just always be enforcing the constraints. And, um, and so this um, uh, is an early experiment where I just like said, okay, I can just, I have this like fully general system where I can programmatically constrain arbitrary amounts of constrained bodies. And um, I could, uh, and so this one I have a bunch of arms and even the arms are formed through constraints. And then one, one of the ends of the arms, each of the arms is constrained to the outer circle and the other is constrained to be the inner circle. And then there's separation between them. I just layered up all the stuff just to try something out and it worked. And, um, and so I uh, was really excited about this. And it even enforced, um, the uh, notion of like uh, the connectivity between um, between uh, let's see where am I um, right 
it, it even just enforced the kinematics of, of the actual thing, um, the, the arms themselves. So as it turned out, I haven't really told you, but I'm actually a dancer. Uh, I really love dance. I, you saw that I was like a music research place and have been pursuing arts. While I was there, I like on top of like meeting Miller Pocket, I met these incredible people, um, Elizabeth Corbett and Les Stuck, who had just, Elizabeth was one of the principal dancers, ballet dancers at the Frankfurt Ballet, and Les was a uh, composer and sound engineer there. And um, they, uh, Betsy had just retired, um, and, and Les then became musical assistant at IRCOM, and he became my best friend, and it was incredible. Um, so I then started just brainstorming with them. It's an incredible, creative, awesome time. Um, and I took a workshop from Betsy on the Lebon Cube and constraints and dance based on uh, the, the choreographer at the Frankfurt Ballet, uh, William Forsythe. Um, I spent hours brainstorming with Les um, in 1994, 92 to 94, and, and from then we, we made some art and thought about it quite a bit from there. Um, and we were just thinking about like how to powerfully choreograph on a computer and make pieces that incorporate dance into them. So it, it, so once now I had, I had this kind of experiment, I was excited, I, I thought back to like, um, you know, Betsy and, and Les, and so it seemed like something was starting to click, was maybe I was on to something, so I went back to look at Forsyth, I knew that he had this curriculum on, this is called uh, Improvisational Technologies, it was a CD-ROM back in the day, um, and he, he, he sort of talked about his work of using constraints and other means to, to kind of formalize and, and uh, encapsulate this, this body of work. Um, and so I read more of his writings and other people's writings about it. I thought it was all remarkable, but I really wanted to sort of have a deeper theory, being a little bit of a scientist, I wanted a deeper theory of constraints in motion and to understand it and test it faithfully and methodically. And also I, had, I built <laughs> this system, so I sort of wanted to, uh, you know, kick the tires and see where it would go. Um, so inspired by him, I embarked on a new body of work, um, building on, on all the previous work. I started, of course, I had to like create a whole new programming language for this and a mechanism for programming with constraints. I, I talked about that. And um, so the first piece in the new, this new genre premiered this last fall, 2022, when I met Wei um, at the San Francisco Dance on Film Festival. Um, Les Stuck, my longtime friend that uh, I talked about, he composed the music, was lucky enough to have him compose the music and help me with the lighting on it. I really got in the deep end. I wanted to show you a little clip from it so you can kind of get a little feeling for where, what I was doing. Um, let me just make sure I get the sound going. This is just the beginning. The degrees of freedom are the number, like when you say num degrees of freedom, it's the number of of uh, motors, basically. So it has 11 motors in it. Okay. I'm going to tease you a little bit with that, but. Uh, just, uh, it's all available, uh, I made it publicly available, so you can check it out. I'll give you the link later. But um, I just want to tell you a little bit of the story of how incredibly hard this was to do and like what went into it. Um, so I had a myriad of challenges. I was totally naive, which uh, good stuff happens by being too naive, thinking you could do something. Um, and so um, it, it's, it really was the hardest engineering art piece I've ever done. Um, so how, so it was like, how do you make, create something that like, I needed something like actually interactive authoring tool to actually compose dance. Um, so this is a whole three minute piece. Um, and, and so like to get at it, I'll explain the choreographic technique, but how do I explore movement ideas quickly? And how could I represent the body? Like I had that loose cartoon thing, but now I'm building a real robot. How do I build a system that would allow me to like map onto a real robot? and also like work within the constraint system. So the first step was to build this digital twin. So it kind of there to represent the actual kinematic chains of the robot and, and to actually interact with it. And I could sort of 
interactively draw things while I had constraints in force. So that's kind of a little bit of an idea. From there, I was like, how do I build physically this thing, right? Like this robot, it's a real robot. I'd always wanted to you know, do work on real robots, but like it's so hard. It's notoriously challenging to design ro robots. Um, and so I had been teaching actually <laughs> computational design, so I had a little bit of knowledge about how to do this. But I, so basically I um, created this generative design technique for parametrically constructing robots. Um, and so I've only done one, but like it's fully general. And so like you can specify any kind of tree structure with links and sizes of motors and stuff like that. And this, um, and so, yeah, and then I, I 3D printed this whole thing on a, a, a pretty high tech um, uh, printer called a Formlabs Fuse One SLS printer. Um, so this is a full set of the parts for the 11 degree of freedom robot. Um, but yeah, it's fully general. Um, then, uh, you know, took, 11 motors and voila, you know, I have a, I have a robot. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I, I'd like to think that it's like orders of magnitude faster to build a robot. And this is kind of where I wanted to go as, as kind of a real experiment and cheaper to build. Um, it's still not like, it's still hard and it takes time to put together. Um, and here's the robot so you guys can check it out later. Um, so building the robot was, was only the beginning of using an art, so I needed to figure, I still needed to figure out like how to map my digital twin onto the real robot for real, like where are the, the zeros and the motors and the directions and all the details you don't, don't wanna hear about, uh, but I had to deal with. Um, and then like on top of that, like, you know, the dynamics of it, like we have inertia, like, you know, how do you control this thing? I just said, I'm not gonna deal with that. I'm gonna delay, so I'm just gonna do frame by frame uh, kinematics, stepping it through. Um, but anyways, this is like the first step of the birth of the robot. I had put the thing together. I was really scared of this thing. And I totally, I turned it on and it almost ripped itself, <laughs> tore itself apart. It was like a, you know, turning, activating a Frankenstein uh, monster. Um, but it survived that luckily. And then I was on from there. So now I'm, I'm gonna talk about like how I choreographed it um, briefly. And so the move, I, I had to like basically come up with a whole bunch of movements. I did, I sort of, based it like on the way the Forsyth Ensemble, I talked to Betsy and, and uh, um, others about like the technique. So I modeled it after that and I went from bottom up, like thinking of ideas and trying that out, mapping in constraints and then trying. And I just wanted to, and, and so then, and also I broke it down into paths plus constraints. So I kind of had this idea like Forsyth that you would have these kind of target paths and then you would be under a system of constraints. And I wanted to give you a little bit of feeling of that. Um, and so here's like one orbit. So I had this kind of fully general orbit mechanism where I could have that green dot kind of moving around. You can see the robot tracking it. So it's moving and tracking. Um, and, and there's no constraints otherwise on this. Okay, so I just want to show you that in the pure form, it's just tracking. Um, so that was my paths. And I could do any path and create like a fully open-ended composable system of that. And then from there, I, I'm just going to talk about like how I could map add in constraints and so movements really like the basic building blocks where these kind of combination of constraints and paths and so in here I added the notion of like adding an ambient constraint which was center of gravity and so here it is doing another orbital path but again now its constraint is the whole body has to be balanced in space okay so I'm running this constraint system running like all the time while it's also at the same time trying to you know, track that green dot. And so it really just gives, you kind of see, and this is why Forsyth was so excited about this kind of constraint system where I have to resolve the rest of my body under these constraints. So it's really good. And also we have so many degrees of freedom that it was a really good way to kind of limit it back. Um, and so I had to build like, so what's that? The next level is like composing all these movements into a full piece. And that was like an incredible amount of work, but I actually, I figured out how to do it. I had experience doing that, doing all these other pieces. And so I really had to like be able to sequence together these systems constraints and then cross fade them and, and put them into a whole. And they all had to be time exact uh, uh, sequence onto a timeline and it was all done programmatically. So this is all done in software. I had created this timeline and then I could collaborate with Les and he could do the music according to the timeline. Okay, so then I thought, well, wow, I'm almost done. No, I had to film it. <laughs> it's like, oh my God. 
Um, and I had no idea. I thought I was making it simpler by like doing stepping each frame and not um, uh, not dealing with dynamics. But in turn, I had to actually film it, light it, and then. So what I ended up doing, long size short, I kind of like did everything. I choreographed on the digital twin, did it 30. Uh, 30th of a second, and then I basically was able to like computer control my digital SLR and do, capture every frame, um, and and then like I had all the frames, and I also in this step the robot, so it was going. So I'd already composed the thing, and then I was just stepping through the choreography one frame at a time. In the end, it took four hours to shoot three minutes, and I did it the night before uh, it was due. Um, and here's what I got. So. You know. Okay. So, any event, um, just to say that it was I was pleasantly surprised at the end, slightly blurry and uh, and um, after spending four hours uh, shooting it and stepping it and terrified of it breaking itself apart. But any event, nearly killed myself making this art piece. Um, but I knew that I was at the beginning of a new genre of artwork with any possibilities, and so I just want to like wrap up and just say where I'm going with the work. Um, you know, I'm super excited about it. Uh, it's still hard work, but I, I think there's a lot of possibilities. I really want to show the work in the gallery. I'm kind of more comfortable in gallery settings um, or on stage. I've done a lot of stage work. Um, I think there's lots of possibilities for it, but the problem is that I need a platform that I can play live. Um, and, and so I needed a better platform. So I've actually started a whole new robot. Here's an example of it. Um, and it has trajectory control, so I can actually um, have my choreography and then play it back um, on it live. Um, and so I just want to like play that for you. So this is like my first experiment of running it. Um, so it's not like without problems, but it's like a little phrase that I was able to do. Okay, um, and then um, see, and also I want to explore other bodies. I really thought of it as these strange bodies that were like kind of like human but different. And so like I can really play with a, what is a body. And I think it freaks you out, but it kind of like gets you more comfortable and more introspective about what my body's doing. If it was exactly like you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think it, it wouldn't be as provocative and thought provoking. So I'm, I'm really excited to like, and then the choreography problem becomes harder. Like this one is like, what do you do with one arm choreography? You know, like that's a really interesting constraint choreographically. But, you know, then there's all sorts of bodies out there to, to try. And then, you know, I really want to improve. Um, I want to like look at like interaction with humans and the world. And uh, this thing can, it actually can run the constraints system in real time. So it can actually improvise. And it can be a never-ending choreography, like an improvisational, like a contact improvisation or whatnot. Um, and, you know, even at, now I've recovered from doing the film, um, I actually really enjoyed it. And I do want to make more movies. I think there's lots of opportunities there for making more, more, more movies. Um, I think the rope, from the filmmaking to the robot, it's a really interesting new medium. And I'm excited to see um, where that goes. Um, so I thank you for your attention. Um, uh, why exchange was like you know it's been a great forum to tell my story. Um, I want to just say like how hard it's been <laughs> to do what I'm doing. I can, I was so underground at MIT, no one would understand or appreciate. I really had to hide it out. Um, but you know in the end, it really fueled my research. I feel like I was kind of stalled until I started making artistic platforms. Um, and, and so I went through this in incredibly productive period while I was inventing programming language, but using them to actually make art. Um, so my hypothesis is that art and science are important muses for each other. Um, and um, I, the only, like one key place where that happened was Xerox Park. Um, it had a tradition of bringing artists in to like push science and invention. But unfortunately, this is a rare marriage these days. So I, I intend to change that and stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, okay, just, uh, just leave, it, leave it going. Yeah, we're gonna invite uh, Terry. We're gonna. Yeah, we.
Exactly. Uh, so we're gonna uh, open for Q and A uh, for folks online, and um, uh, Dai can hear you. You can tell Dai your question, or you just enter on the uh, uh, chat, on, and that will tell us your questions. Um, so first, really thank you. Two fantastic, uh, amazing, amazing work. I, I love, love it. Um, now for the audience, uh, what do you have questions for the for the speakers, and what do you think? I actually have a question, so I'm going to use my power as a moderator. I'm going to just squeeze in my question first. So um, I'm looking at the two of your work, and one thing just likes me that both of your work takes a lot of labor. Yeah, this is something we're researching here too, by the way. By the way, I'm really, really interested to hear your your thought about like uh, like you know there's there's a the work has end form, but it's also the fact that it's so much labor to create this end form. How does the labor affect the work? In which way is the labor integral part of the work? So that's the question number one. The question number two really is that today uh, we all being bombarded by the AI, GPT, as you mm. all you can see. And now, what if uh, the AI someday can can reduce your labor and uh, and automate the thing? You can just tell the AI to do the thing you want to do. This is happening in the programming world, and like I can ask AI to program for me. Does it affect your artwork? So. Really, you too. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I'll start with your first one, I guess. Um, I mean, oh yeah, sh I don't, I don't know how I feel about AI trying to make my sculptures, <laughs> if, if whatever. But okay, back to the. Um, I think, I mean, for me, the um, the labor is. Um, I mean, I could relate to Jonathan saying this took a really long time at different times there. Um, but I think for me, um, you know, the work is driven by ideas, um, but also I, you know, and I, I, you know, I'm teaching all the time and I, I do talk to students about like that half of idea is enough to get you started. And when you start making with your hands, you're still thinking and that, that, that is another um, you know, society calls it, you know, whatever, making, playing, whatever, constructing, but it is you are thinking ideas with that. And I think, um, and I think you never know what's going to come out of that. And I think, um, it, it also redirects, you know, it gives you information about what's working in the physical world, what's not, and you have to redirect, um, out because it went a way you didn't want it to go. Um, so I think, um, yeah, I mean, there's something just that makes me so happy with making with my hands. Um, and if I'm not doing it for a while, like, you know, my partner's like, you know, kind of like tells me to leave to, you know, go to the studio, go, go cut up some wood, go make something because it, it, I think it's really um, integral to kind of figuring out the physical world. Um, and I, um, yeah. So, but I think there's also a lot of room for play in that too. Um, like, um, I think as Paul Koss always kind of referred to it like that. <clears throat> um, the second one, I don't know. I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, so I envy you, Terry. Um, I want to get my hands dirty and do, like, yeah, I looked at you, like, building, because I love to build things, and I often, like, spend all the time on the computer, and then everything has to work. But, you know, like, when you build a building, like, people are figuring stuff out. Like, it's incredible, like, how good people are at, like, in situ kind of design. Design and fabrication kind of are intertwined, whereas in computer stuff, it's, like, so split, and I think you kind of lose the plot. And so, like, <clears throat> what I didn't say is, like, I'm working on a new company, and I'm really like trying. Like, I think like the stretch. It's a new design tool for electronics. So the, the stretch goal for any tool is like, can it can it serve? Can can electronics be a, like a new artistic medium? And so, like, I really want to like, I aspire to that. And I feel like you lose the plot. You kind of 
you you don't you're not as as yeah integrated into the creative process and i the play isn't it's a different kind of play and so you're sort of like hacking on your code but you're not getting the results and you anyways i found myself also like using my body because it was really good to like figure out moves. i would think out moves you know and it was really hard to do that so i think we have far to go there and uh yeah i i'm excited by some work now with kind of more embodied design tools where the design and the fabrication are integrated um so i, th I think that's the labor you're asking like whether the labor was part I, is definitely as part of you know and i wish that it was more productive that way um because it's it's more creative as you're laboring when you're actually you know working with your hands on things um and the ai obviously i've thought about the ai thing i mean i did my phd it was always the dream um uh i did my phd in neural networks so like to see it now is like sort of strange to see what's going on um i do think there's all like and also like you saw that i worked with carol cohen and so like you wouldn't believe the dates the debates that people had the grad students were so threatened by this guy writing this program um and the interviews with him was he was like saying this is going to be the first program that would make an original piece of art uh like his art would like he would write this program that would he died you know like and that was like a really cool but um ultimately i think there's just a lot i, I love what you did i like your you, you're so thoughtful and deep about like those decisions are still like so human and so like part of us i don't see i think it it what is really great is just to like be able to have brainstorm out ideas and i think it could be very good as as a tool to sort of like explore possibilities but it won't replace like you know who's going to come up with your awesome things like i that you, you're coming through so many things that's not going to happen um for a while so any event we have a question online if there's none in the room Uh, this is a question for both of you, and it's really about methodology. Um, on the one hand, being with other people from other disciplines and finding that they work in different ways uh, and with different tools. Um, and also uh, for Jonathan, uh, you know, coming from multiple disciplines, doing so much of the work yourself, uh, but learning different methods. Uh, at what points uh, are there specific? you can point to you know at what point do you abandon a method do, at what point do you abandon something you learn um when do you let it drop and let somebody else pick it up or do you when do you say i've had enough of 2d rendering i've got to move into 3d etc okay. uh so i didn't quite get like you're talking about like the challenge of collaborating and how to let go Oh yeah. Um, well, you know, it starts and stops and like I have a bunch of ideas. You know, I kind of store them away. I mean, this was like a little bit of a long time where I've really felt stumped for a long time. I knew that I couldn't really do what I wanted to do and a lot of stuff had to happen. So this whole idea of constraints, I didn't know how to do it. And so I had to go through all these other, uh, you know, artworks and, and uh, systems. And, and then at some point it all came together. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, it's hard to give up the creative process completely, but yeah, I like what you're saying, like collaborating is good and Les did an incredible job on the music. So um, that, that was good. Um, I would like to hear what you have to say about like collaboration and other things. Sarah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, th I think collaboration is great for getting out of your own head, but it also does invite a whole new series of problems and 
potential conflicts or disagreements or like negotiating that has to happen. And so I think the process can be a lot longer in that sense. And then just thinking about different methodologies, like, um, I mean, for me, it's like, I don't know. I mean, sometimes it's just instinctual, like, like I have tech or electronic and I work with I collaborate I'm in a position and and assist that doing the stuff I do kind of um you know I feel like the project can go further because if they're an expert in their field they can kind of they're more fluid with how they can figure out things um, electronically or prog program programming things. Um, and so I think sometimes when I have like a piece, I tend to want to go totally analog after that or, um, and so I think, but then it's also sort of like, what's the, what's the vehicle that, you know, what's the form or sound or, or shape that will best convey the idea you know and so it's kind of this like never ending like searching for the right thing um and then you just kind of settle on something on the moment i think um based on a you know long list of factors that you're kind of very you know variable um that's how i do it at least and i think um you know, the same you know like there's millions of keeping that that sketch sketchbook full of those ideas, but then also, like, you know, they have like, you know, I need to do it now. Like, they're sort of whether it's, you know, whether on in my life that makes it feel like it's the most important thing, and then also like, it's like a ref culturally, how is it reflecting the culture, and like, why is it needed at this time? Um, so I think I'm kind of always balancing those yeah and, and like i just wanted to say because terry and i were talking about like institutional support and whatnot and like yeah like i was saying i, I feel like a misfit and it's been really hard life um but uh you yeah. know i bounce around because like it's never a good fit you know like and so like i i would i was like a crazy career like of going and now i'm doing a startup but, like basically i left academia and then and then we created a non-academic research lab called Other Lab. And then I was, and then when I go back to academia because I wanted to like actually do research, but then I decided actually a better place would be to create my own thing. And now I'm building a whole culture of a company and eventually we will do the free form research and like we're building the way, but like, I think institutional support is really hard and that like affects how you approach your problems and whatnot. And there's not, not a good fit these days for you know multi like these kind of renaissance people um and so i really want to change that i feel strongly about like how it, it's it has been easy <laughs> being me and so i want to make it easier for other people to have that yeah uh, i really resonate with you uh, on that with you uh we have from online Uh, apologize. Hey, Wei, can you keep that mic further from people's mouths? It's cutting out when it's too close. Yes. Sure. Okay. So maybe we have the. Oh. That mic is. A... Right. Um, so the question for Jonathan, I blur my thoughts enough. It seems like the constraint based system you are describing is related to subsumption architecture where you have track target, stay balanced, don't run into yourself, don't demand more talk than you, are, than you have available, et cetera. Firing, do, do you then as closely relate, do you them as closely related, something like that? Do you see them as closely related, yeah. I, um, I, is is what like, they didn't that like I'm not being a good actor credit to all the people that 
worked on constraint our architecture was like kind of the thing that Rod Brooks did at IT, kind of like a reactive system that managed a whole bunch of concerns and balanced them out. I didn't ever think. Blown uh, system to kind of eat itself and do all the survival and life type activity. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. Um, uh, so I'll have to think about that more. Um, so it kind of had like a bunch of like little agents that it could move between, like that were like systems of constraints that it could focus on and and activate and which ones were important. So that was kind of how it operated. Um, right. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm, it's really, I'm so surprised that uh, by simple constraints, um, it creates such a rich movement. It's, then you just think about our life, uh, it's like how much of uh, things happens is actually due to constraint. It's really interesting. It, yeah, our uh, uh, hands is first, let's have a bit <laughs> yeah, I think uh, your hand is now. Your eye. For collaboration is the thing that I wanted to get at, which feels related but to the nourishment you're both. It's like, how do we stay in the world and be open to something completely unknown and have enough the right kind of structure, having something there to move, right? So anyway, that wasn't a question, but I would love to hear <laughs> someone say something about emergence. <laughs> I did a whole workshop. Like I participated in a whole workshop on emergence. I think the hardest part was it's a beautiful thing when it happens, but how do you control it? Like science, like the world has a lot of emergence, but how as artists can we marshal that? And so that my work with uh, my work was an attempt. Proto was it, we we programmed swarm robots and and biology and a lot of things that were kind of a lot of agents like and tried to these emergent behaviors. So that was my attempt at it. It's not easy to do, but you know, um, any event. They're bubbling up and thinking of it as a, a activist strategy for organizing um, but and relying on model. Okay, they can hear you now. Okay, Go thank ahead. you. Um, so thank you very much to both of you. Um, so uh, I'm not an artist, I'm engineer by trade. Um, 
And I think one thing that engineers and artists share is that you have this initial idea phase and you wake up and you're excited and then you have hopes for the idea. And, and then the second phase, I'm curious. So as an engineer, you hope your ideas come to fruition and they don't, they don't always, sometimes it just doesn't work. Um, for an artist kind of, what does the emotional journey feel like? Like, what does it, what does it feel like for the art not to come together? And then what does it feel like when it, you know, clicks? Um, well, I mean, I think there is like a, <clears throat> there's a, um, uh, yeah, I mean, so the initial idea is exciting, and and then there's um, there's definitely the um, for me, I think what drives most of my projects is that there has to be like the unknown, like whether it's like I don't know how to do it, some aspect of that, like or it's a new material or a new scale, um, and so like always kind of continuously challenging and pushing myself. So then when I get to that phase, um, sometimes it's like seamless because it's like, oh, I know um, someone who works in programming or someone who is a composer or someone that I feel like would be a good fit for that. And that, you know, I feel like I would have a good dialogue with, because it's basically like in those collaborations, you're like, you know, you're sharing like your mind with someone. And so it's like, uh, it's it's a very intimate process I feel like and so sometimes like I have to feel comfortable with that person to want to like continue working with them um so yeah so the I mean it, it and some things take longer to realize than others and and also sometimes you never know if you need to abandon it so there are yeah it can be totally depressing and difficult at different times um I mean I think that's why I just try to surround myself with other artists and non-artists that are kind of like can kind of balance out whatever you're feeling in there um and I think it's just like and then when something does come together like um like I would say like the 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 collaboration the last piece I showed a kind of ache was um it was a challenging collaboration just with like like I don't do well not meeting people in person. So I'm trying to collaborate with a composer I've never met in person um, across the country. And I, we weren't, to, you know, like it, it never got to a place where I felt like we gelled on, online. <laughs> and so it, I was never really sure where the piece was until I saw it performed. And then I was extremely happy that, I, <laughs> that we stuck through with it. Um, and I think it's um, a really good piece. Um, and like, that feels great. <clears throat> You know, I mean, so it's it's just like, I don't know, it's like a bipolar, like ups and downs of, of that. Yeah, I don't know. Yes, so I guess it's, it's equally devastating when something doesn't work. I think like sometimes you have to think, put things on the shelf. Um, I think you have the same strategies of like just like um taking a break being able to verbalize stuff to people and problem solve out things um i just want to like i don't know how it is for you terry but like every time a show will work i take it so seriously it's so much work i just like i know that i have to show really strongly and a lot of the time you show in the primary outcome is an opening and it's like everything goes into that and so it's pretty it's pretty crazy <laughs> to like uh to do that's that's like one of the biggest differences is it's like this big crescendo moment and you have to like stay up all night and like it's it's just intense because you know that if you don't do well you'll regret it really really seriously so um that but yeah you have to use all these oblique strategies to kind of like problem solve and ultimately because you know you're going to show it and it you just don't show anything that isn't good enough um you know so you have to shelve it and try to figure it out well time really flies at um i can't believe it's 8 34 already so maybe we'll have one last question but let's keep it short uh oh i see alex has one last question yes it's it, it, it's short and it's um 
and well, it's it it arises out of out of your work, Terry. Which and it, so you have these musical instruments that are in running around in circles, and the keyboard is limited. So talking about constraints, you know, and and then thinking and Jonathan about eleven degrees of freedom in a three dimensional world. That's massive numbers of uh, like uncountable but anyway but so but my really the question basically is um do you in that circle do you bring it back so that in any one section it's always continuous so you know so which in a circle you can do because Half of it, you know, you go from high to low, and then you go from low down to high. So the circle completes, or is there a place where you come to a stop and you have to, you jump suddenly from high to low? Is there a cliff to jump? <laughs> well, uh, I guess I'm trying to, is this, do you mean more conceptually or do you mean physically? Well, I guess in the two piece, the two like circular pieces, it's sort of a continuation and not a drop off. But if I'm following you. The piano. Well, the the piano piece is called "Where the Beginning Meets the End," which was, which is because that's something that wouldn't happen right in the piano. Like the, the low keys would never be next to the high keys, and so, and I was actually just talking to someone about it, and then they were like, "Oh, I love where the beginning meets the end because those two keys, like they're all nested so that they fit together in in a way." Um, so, uh, I, I mean, I, I think I'm following you and I think I could, I mean, I could program it to do anything, I guess. Right. And, but I ended up just having it one-to-one -one, since all the keys are one through 88. I just, I just, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the jump. Yeah. Yeah. In any one section. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to like say one thing because it reminded me. Uh, Patrick asked, like, what do you do when it doesn't work? You throw it out. Like, that's the hardest <laughs> thing. Like, basically, the best artists are the people that say no to everything. They don't like build this relationship where they can't say goodbye. Like you have to say goodbye and like just pick the ink, the best stuff. And so that whole circular thing reminded me of that. And then also like that, I actually found that doing these kind of linear movements didn't work well. So I actually went with circles. And so I was very much like kind of more into like a Tai Chi movement that really worked well. So I tried so many different things. I said no to everything that did it. You just learn. And that's the way foresight did. He, he was brutal and people, it, it made people cry. I mean, it was like, you work so hard on something and then you just, it doesn't work. You have to say goodbye to it. Edit, so edit, I, edit. Yeah, it's really hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Well, it's, it's this time of night. I'm gonna, let's give a round of applause to, to artists. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, everyone online. Um, well, have a wonderful evening. And uh, actually, there's Jiara in Shanghai. Have a wonderful day. Um, now, um, so uh, we're going to turn the lights on. You can feel free to keep on stay here and chat a little bit. And uh, Patricia is going to start a, the installation we've been working on here. So stay chatting and uh, talk to Patricia and experience the installation. And uh, thanks everybody for coming over. Thank you.
Okay, good to see you. Yeah, Thanks yeah, for coming. Cool. Yeah, I appreciate it. We found out separately from. Uh, cool.